Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Wonder House. Um, today's presentation is a continuation of this morning's presentation around Authentic Voices, a series around finding and owning your own voice. I'm Kendra Heisen, a trained landscape architect, graduate of the University of Arizona, associate at Smith Group, co-founder of the Urban Studio, and I'm here with my colleague. I'm Kenneth Kokroko. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the University of Arizona and a registered landscape architect. And so today, this activity is going to run through a hypothetical neighborhood planning challenge where we are going to try to put ourselves in the shoes of other fellow residents and think about how we can help elevate their voices through removing barriers and bringing them more, creating a more inclusive planning process. Okay, so as we turn the slide, I want to introduce you to uh, the neighborhood, our hypothetical neighborhood, what I like to call Any Hood USA. Uh, and this is because this could be a neighborhood in any American city, right? This is often the type of place that Kendra and I work in where inequitable and racialized policies of disinvestment um, and a general lack of basic services have led to extremely distressed neighborhoods, as you can see by this word cloud that we've created here. Um, in neighborhoods like this, scenes of vacancy, illegal dumping, and blight, also um, adjacent land uses that are incompatible with residential neighborhoods are the norm, not to mention uh, lack of access to healthy foods, recreational open spaces, and safe mobility options. And one way we try to mitigate some of these issues of distress in our communities is through community engagement. And we try to make those community engagement processes as inclusive as possible by what we do and meeting people where they are. There's some photos of Kenneth and I doing some engagement in specific communities in Detroit. And I'm based in Washington, DC, working with youth and helping the, these communities and groups of people learn how to use their voice and use design as a way to solve some of their community challenges. And so today we're going to go into an exercise. Sorry, did I go ahead too fast? No, you're good. Okay, go for it. so what we're here to do is talk about how highlighting disabilities like vacant land, as you can see in the green here, and abandoned buildings in the darker color, um, disconnected streets, things that are typically seen as liabilities in neighborhoods. We want to encourage you to think about how residents might benefit if these liabilities were actually reimagined as community assets and resources. And that's really what landscape architects often do. So if you lived here, as we go through this presentation, think about what changes would you want to see? And if you look behind you, these are images that are typical in some of these distressed neighborhoods. Vacant housing, illegal dumping, blight. Think about some of the new uses for these spaces that you'd like to see if you lived here. What would you suggest? And what words could we use to repopulate this really terrible word cloud with much more positive types of language and evocative um, imagery. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put ourselves in Any Hood USA. We are residents of Any Hood USA. And here are some of our neighbors, Louise, Walter, and Marco. And you can see their descriptions of who they are. I mean, this is obviously not who they are in their entirety as people. But for demographic purposes, we have Louise, who's a working mom. She is in her late 40s. She's a longtime resident of this community. And she wants to see some change to improve the safety and conditions for her kids in the community. And we have Walter, who's a wheelchair user. He's a young guy. He's also a part of the Neighborhood Association. And he grew up in this community. And he has been frustrated at the lack of accessibility along the streets and wants to do something about it. And then we have Marco, who just recently became a member of the community. He moved in with his family. Um, he's retired. He's in his 70s. He's a native Spanish speaker, and he just moved to the States. And he has a 13-year-old granddaughter that he loves spending time with, but he feels that the community is not quite safe to do that. There's not a lot of activities or services provided to seniors. And so all of these folks have really different challenges that they're facing. And oftentimes, these are groups that we don't really always address in our planning processes. And so we're, we are going to try to figure out ways we can remove their barriers to participation. And so um, I told you all about Louise's backstory. This is the community she lives in. Um, as a longtime resident, Louise recalls a time when the school building 
was much more than just this sort of blighted, um, distressed building, but a hub for the community and offered safe places to play and learn with, um, within the space. Um, she, wanted to, she wants to see uses similar to that come back into the community, but she's gotten wind that development is going in a different direction. It's going to be implementing things in her community that don't necessarily meet her specific needs. So um, Louise wants to participate in public meetings, but like I said, she's a nurse. She works nights. She has three kids. Coming to a typical public meeting at 4 o'clock on a Wednesday is just not feasible. And so we have to find ways to make sure Louise can have her voice heard in this process. And so we want to hear what you think about how can we support Louise's participation in the planning process. This is designed to be interactive, so you can get out your phones and you can text the word WONDER to 37607, or you can yell your answers out loud if you're not into the whole text thing. But <laughs> once you text WONDER to 37607 in the thread, you'll get a message back with a link. And then you can just start typing in your message thread answers or to our prompt. So how can we support Louise's participation in the planning process? So the number is 37607. You're going to text the word wonder, uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter. And you'll, then you'll be a part of the poll. Yeah, and we already added a couple um, ideas in here. So one idea which Kendra mentioned might be, or maybe she didn't, but we've met, talked about it. <laughs> uh, Pay her for her time. OK, some people are starting to add ideas, right? So what are things that would really help us help Louise? So hold meetings at a time that works for her. That's a good one. Um, that's pretty simple, right? We <laughs> could also yeah. provide email updates. Those work. Provide child care, pay her for her time. Um, Online polling and voting, yes, that, those are really good answers because now I, I just recently conducted a full community engagement plan in vir virtual because of the pandemic. So online polling, online places for her to go to participate are really great ideas. Record meetings and let her send her feedback post meeting. So some of the challenges with these particular options is that planners are human, civic leaders are human, Sometimes they don't get to everybody's email. Sometimes it falls to the bottom of the list. Have multiple days and times for meetings. That's a great one. And so we want to make sure that the civic leaders who are making decisions in her community, that Louise has access to those people, and that she can do some, and that we can use some of these strategies to make sure we meet her where she is. All right. Should we do another poll, Kendra? Yeah, we're going to do another poll. You can text that same thread. No need to type wonder again. But if you're just joining us, you're going to type text wonder to 37607 to participate in the poll. Um, but if you're already got the thread going, you can add some things just to the same thread. And so if you were Louise in Louise's position, what new uses for the site would you like to see? So this is an old school site. Across the street, there's some vacant land. Um, it's dilapidated. And Louise, again, she has children. She works in the evening. She's looking for resources to provide a better um, atmosphere for her kids. So after school programming, um, improved lighting, child care centers, transitioning some of this open space into active space that can actually be productive for the community. Because otherwise, these spaces become breeding grounds for criminal activity. Um, community activity center, that's a great one. After school programs. Bring back the school, but maybe. Maybe remodel, I'm assuming that model changes. The school so, model, OK, yeah. So maybe. we're going to remodel the school. These are great ideas, right? And so um, if I could go ahead, Kendra, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these, like I said, these are all great. Like Kenneth said, these are all great ideas. And if we think about these vacant lots and the adjacent vacancies as opportunities to meet Louise's needs as opposed to um, liabilities, we can then reimagine this entire community. And now we can sort of move into our new space, next slide, Kenneth, that now provides a community hub, right? And so as landscape architects and planners, we go through these processes of trying to create 
ways to engage with people, whether that be virtual, in person. We have to meet people where they are. We have to understand what keeps people away from these processes so we can deliver products that actually meet people's needs. And ultimately, we began by creating this neighborhood hub, transitioning the school into something much more um, better than an abandoned building, obviously, and some new open spaces where her children can go and play safely. She can go and get community resources. It begins revitalizing the community and now creating an amenity for any hood USA. So just to wrap up by listening to Luis's voice, thinking about her needs, we've taken that word cloud that was really just pretty shitty, if I might be frank, and made it into something that's much nicer, right? So with your help, let's do the same thing for Walter and consider Walter's situation. Uh, Walter remembers a wheelchair user, but he's, and he's currently struggling, you know, he's noticed that the current state of his neighborhood in terms of the streets and the accessibility is really poor. And you can see that in some of those images there. Uh, this could include things like really long blocks, poor sidewalks, limited ADA accessibility, um, unsafe crossings, right? So Walter recognizes, let's assume, that he's in a unique position to benefit from changes and improvements in this neighborhood that help improve accessibility. But he also recognizes that those basic improvements that help him are gonna help children living in the neighborhood, are gonna help elderly people, and generally improve the neighborhood as a whole, right? So, given his position, as his bio kinda says here, as a member of the Neighborhood Association, Walter wants to help make the case to the city that these improvements for his neighborhood um, should be prioritized and funded, okay? So I think we're gonna do a poll, oh, not a poll quite yet. Yeah, no, we're oh, at the poll. Okay. We're polling you guys again. So um, again, if you just joined us, text WONDER to 37607. I'm gonna have that number memorized by the end of this. Um, and feel free to begin to add to the word cloud or add to our prompt, what barriers to accessibility does Walter face? And so what we've highlighted here in green are some more of those opportunity areas, like, uh, what did I say? Like adjoining vacant parcels, right? Streetscape edges, These, this big thoroughfare here. These are all areas where a person with a disability or mobility challenge person like Walter might be able to see some benefits. So we have lack of shade, Poor lighting, again, with the poor lighting, we, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> um, accessible sidewalks are not really around, uh, bad sidewalks, overgrown weeds, unsafe uh, road crossings, narrow paths. These things all make it very difficult for Walter to be an active participant in his community. And so we want to keep adding to that. No areas for fitness or athletic activities, exactly. And as we put ourselves in the mindset of somebody else, somebody who maybe doesn't have a voice in the process of kind of planning neighborhood improvements, think about what you have in your neighborhoods where you live. What things make it easier for you to get around that a neighborhood that's distressed, like we talked about, might not already have? Go ahead and keep adding those answers. These are all really great. Kendra, should I yeah. go ahead to the next um, Yeah, slide? let's go into... We're going to continue the polling. So kind of based on understanding what the barriers Walter's facing, what improvements to the neighborhood streets do you think that we could add? How can we change the existing conditions to really improve uh, the neighborhood accessibility for Walter? Um, these could include some things that we've already kind of started to show here. But again, think about where you live. What makes it easy for you to get around? What are the things that make it easy for your elderly grandmother to move through spaces, for your children? And let's start to talk about that. Work with Area Transportation Authority to ensure access. Somebody has a lot of faith in DDOT. <laughs> I'm not that convinced, but you know, <laughs> no offense to any transportation folks in here. Safe, accessible um, cut through. Better signage. Lower speed limits, that's a great one. Um, so that we can make the streets generally more walkable, not just for Walter, but for uh, lots of other people. Who said um, the cut through thing? I'm just curious. Was that like a designer, a landscape architect, somebody? No? <laughs> hey, that, I love that one, that's great. The textures on the paths um, with inclines so there's no slip. So those types of answers actually provide more accessibility for people other than Walter who are in a wheelchair. They provide accessibility for those who might be visually impaired and they need to change in texture to identify where they are on the street. 
Um, so these are great answers. Let's go ahead and move ahead. And OK, so remember, we're looking at opportunities um, that could exist. So if we take a look at the adjoining um, bacon parcels and start to reimagine these um, as, again, assets, not liabilities, um, just like really in several projects that I've worked on in Detroit, we can reimagine these vacant spaces as potentially greenways or a network of non-motorized transportation that can help people like Walter move through the neighborhood much more effectively. Weird, weird echo. Um, or provide recreational open spaces or community gathering areas as well. And solutions like this really show that we don't always need um, to replace um, you know, dilapidated housing or vacant lots with new housing. And some of the solutions that we could provide can be really simple, but still support um, an enhanced mobility network in a neighborhood, right? So let's take a look at another uh, mobility related change we can make, Kendra. And so um, if we think about opportunities to enhance accessibility and open space in the neighborhood and the local streets, um, making them a great place to invest, um, we want to, I don't even know where I am on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but also we know that underserved and distressed communities uh, experience a lot of this lack of streetscape infrastructure that adds to um, lesser environments ecologically, stormwater challenges of flooding, challenges with heat island, all of these things sort of play into um, the quality of life for community members in spaces like this. And so, next slide. We, when we think about enhancing our streets, making them safer for not just Walter, but for everyone, we can then provide amenities that increase property values, that reduce uh, your heating bills. They add value not just to the community, but to you as an individual as well, providing shady streets so there is more walkable. And that way we have people getting more exercise and, the, and reducing rates of diabetes and all of these different things that come from improving our streetscapes. And they're really simple interventions. Like planting a tree is not that complicated. Like. <laughs> That's right. I mean, that's the like landscape architect motto. <laughs> Planting a tree is not that complicated. OK, and so finally, if we take a look over here um, and think about how Walter and the Neighborhood Association might want to transform um, some of the major streets uh, corridors, like you see in this image or over here, um, many of these neighborhood corridors really um, are car centric, you know, and that's just kind of the legacy of how uh, development has occurred over the past. But these commercial corridors really are like an economic lifeblood of a neighborhood, right? And so reimagining these streetscapes as more walkable, accessible, and active public amenities is really a great way to encourage people to get out and spend money in their own communities, right? And so if we pivot from the type of car-centric you know, corridor and streetscape that we see here and move to something where we envision a more complete street, we see a much livelier public realm where the safety of non-motorized modes of travel is prioritized via maybe protected bike lanes or pedestrian islands that reduce the distance for a pedestrian crossing, right? Where people have mobility options. Maybe there's bus rapid transit, right? When we start doing greening projects like this, we really provide opportunities for people to comfortably spend time on the street and support their local businesses. And again, like Kendra was saying, this reduces kind of that blight that creates opportunities for crime and other negative consequences of vacancy, okay? So, <laughs> And so altogether, these improvements can drastically change the look and feel of this community. As you can see so far, we got our community hub that was advocated by Louise. We have our greenways, which provide alternative access to, um, through the neighborhood that are safe. We have improved street conditions. All of these things further build and improve upon like, the general environment in any hood USA. OK. So I'm going to introduce Marco to you all. If you recall from his backstory, uh, somewhat Marco is an elderly gentleman, someone who's new to the neighborhood. But as somebody who's just moved in and is maybe not as used to some, seeing some of these scenes that you see behind you, he's really disappointed, right, in the vacancy that's in this area. 
And I think that if we think about you know, who Marco is and how much time he might have, it's probably pretty <laughs> easy for him to start thinking about ideas other than seeing vacancy in his neighborhood and really start to plan, OK, how can I change this area, right? So Marco thinks, let's imagine, that many of these vacant lands and spaces could be used to provide maybe more programmed outdoor space for seniors, right, or children. Or these homes could maybe be rehabbed. Maybe there's um, workforce training opportunities to rehab the homes and teach people basic skills, right? So he wants to enlist his granddaughter, who he loves spending time with, and you can see here, uh, to help him start a social media campaign to organize other seniors to really improve these spaces. Because we all know our seniors love Facebook <laughs> and Nextdoor and getting on there and getting together and talking about issues. So it's a great way for Walter to gain camaraderie and build interest around what he's trying to do, as well as spend time with his granddaughter. Okay, so guess what's coming up again? Another poll. It's another poll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so put yourself in Walter's shoes. What do you think are some of the challenges that these vacant spaces might be presenting to his neighborhood and to him? And what do you think he would like to see um, in terms of, well, I guess that's the next poll. But what do you, <laughs> So what are some of the challenges, though? I see we, so if you haven't participated yet, um, oh, yep. text the word WONDER to 37607. And then you can start participating in the poll in your text thread, adding some of the things you think are challenges with the vacant buildings. Did you skip Crying. forward? No, I didn't. No, oh. we're on the right side here. <laughs> OK. So decreased property values, crime opportunities, vandalism, unsafe areas where he doesn't want his grandchild to go, um, squatting. That's a good one, actually. I, know. I didn't, didn't even, even think, think about that, that one. Jinx, yeah. um, that, that's a great one. Green spaces and parks, uh, rodents, yes. Those are all things that can come from these vacant buildings and this land being underutilized. Yeah, Drugs. This, is, this is awesome. Really great responses. So let's go ahead. So again, we're going to do one more poll. I think this is our last poll you guys get to participate in. And we're going to look at how can we respond to Marco's concerns about vacancy of land and buildings in this neighborhood. So asbestos, lead and paint. Oh, uh, so that was probably an old one from the last oh, okay. problem, right? Uh, yeah. Workforce training to rehab homes, that's a really good one. That also provides job opportunities. So we want to think about solutions that can have multiple um, implications, not just solving one problem, but how can we solve a variety of problems through design? Yeah, um, can you think of anything in your neighborhood, right, where there's small, maybe open watch. spaces? The community watch is a good one, especially for a senior like Walter who's probably at home, and then he can get his other senior buddies on board, and they can, you know, peeping out the window. That's what my grandma used to do. Okay, so these are really great responses. Thanks, everyone, for participating <laughs> in the poll. And so if we then start to imagine vacant buildings as opportunities, say, for workforce training like we saw there, uh, we can start to think of adjoining projects uh, vacant parcels as opportunities for development of, say, new multifamily housing, right? Where we have, or maybe it's senior, senior housing. Maybe it's senior housing, right? Um, and where the character of the neighborhood might be preserved as we rehab old buildings. Um, and this is not really something I just think it's worth mentioning that's in the purview of a landscape architect, per se, or even an urban designer. But in planning projects, we do have the power to make policy recommendations for improvements like this and for funding like this. And so this is still an important aspect of the work that we do. Let me go to the next slide here. So and regarding the vacant parcels and Marco's desire to see more programmed open spaces, these spaces often function as informal open spaces generally because they're vacant. So people use them for all different types of things, some savory, some unsavory. Um, but if we thought we're more thoughtful about these open spaces and how we could connect these open spaces together to actually serve um, the community at large, we can then come to a much more opportunistic um, like a asset in our community. Um, we can install community gardens. We can have parks that maybe have some physical activity spaces for seniors. Now we can even connect to the greenway that allows us to move through the community some more. Um, and even continue to build on what Louise has done and what the, Wal the work Walter has done to improve the community. That's right. 
So we've done some really great work here today. I know it was fast how much we've de <laughs> developed this neighborhood. But as we wrap up, I really want us to emphasize that the work that landscape architects and urban designers do is about much more than designing amazing spaces, though that really is a lot of what we, what we do. More importantly, though, and I think, Kendra, you'd certainly agree based on the work that I know you do, our work is really about lifting up the voices of people who really don't often have a say in how their communities are developed or how their neighborhoods change over time. Um, and helping them in the process uh, have their voice heard. And so we hope that being here with us today, uh, we helped you to understand that the work we do is important because empowering people to own their voices um, is just a really important way to change blighted neighborhoods like we saw into transformed neighborhoods. Yeah, and if we take a more grassroots approach where we're working with the community to create these incremental changes, we can reduce the rates of displacement as opposed to a community getting sort of swept over and completely redeveloped. We have now sort of taken some of the liabilities and turned them into opportunities, and we've improved the neighborhood for not just for the people who live there as well as for future generations. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think we'll open it up to questions. Any questions about community development, about how to get people to utilize their voice in the process? The work landscape architects do. The work landscape architects do. What are some of the things that you've seen be most successful as far as like getting people involved? Um, some Wait, of the things yeah. I've seen be most successful, um, hmm. Really going out to the, like the communities already have a sense of camaraderie and they already have things happening in their community events. Um, so going to those events, meeting people where they are tends to be a really great place to start because number one, it shows that we know what's happening in the community. We've been paying attention. Number two, it shows our willingness to sort of step out of this pre-planned comfort zone of, hey, we're going to do our community meeting like this at this time when it's convenient for us, and we're showing up to when it's convenient for the residents. And that way, then you can start to begin to build trust and build community with them because you're participating in something that they've decided that they were going to host. So I know in my community, there is a basketball league. And so going to the Marvin Gaye Park to the basketball league tournaments is a really great way to begin to sort of connect with people. I mean, you've got to take your bag off you know you can't you don't want to seem like a, a narc you know kind of in the community <laughs> but you, um, and you want to make sure that you're connecting with people organically but those are some of the best places to start before you have your own event say hey we're gonna do some great development in your community you go to what they were their hosting events find out what their issues are and then you go move forward from there and just if I could add on to that I'd say you know Oftentimes, I like to think of landscape architects in these engagement processes as like um, conveners, right, of ideas and just really opening up and providing that space where people can have conversations. So the more like activities you can bring that help people kind of feel like they're understanding why a choice might be made versus another choice, I think that's a really good way to get buy-in too where, you know, we've done um, activities where we kind of like do a, it's called participatory budgeting, right? You give people a slew of amenities that they might want to see, but you say, hey, look, you only have enough money to afford this many or this many based on their individual costs. And so people start to work through, well, I really do need some lighting in my neighborhood and it costs this versus new sidewalks kind of cost that. And so they can kind of start to mix and match and think about what needs to go in to improve things, but then also prioritize and think about, well, I, you know, everybody wants everything, but the reality just is you can't have it. And so giving some agency in the process of decision making, but also helping educate people in why we can't just have whatever we want. A 66 foot wide right of way for a street can't fit bus lanes, bike lanes, you know, scooter lanes, all that stuff. So we've got to budget our time, our space, you know, our resources. Yeah, I think that speaks to trade-offs. I think a lot yeah. of times people come into meetings and they, or they come to a community development event and they have a particular thing they want in mind, like we want a park, that's all we want. 
And so we have, it's our job to sort of manage expectations and also help people understand, OK, if you want this, that means we can't get this for another however many years. Or if you want this, this ramification might happen in the process. We could exacerbate displacement if, we're do if we approach it this way. So it helps people to sort of think more critically about the decisions that they want to make for their community. Thanks. Any other questions? So what community or city is leading the pack on this kind of activity? <laughs> <laughs> you, are you going to go first? I oh, no. I mean, I don't know which one's leading the pack. Everybody's trying. I mean, you, I think it's... You know, you, go ahead, I was going to say, you know whose who's comprehensive plan to me has been one of the ones that I look to is Minneapolis, mm. um, Minnesota. They have really done a lot of work around equity and inclusivity and civic engagement and really digging deep into what the community's needs are. And I think it's sort of been a model for other places. And I think in the wake of sort of George Floyd, everybody's really approach, trying to approach this from this more um, inclusive standpoint and sort of making sure that resources are equitably distributed. So a lot of places are including those things in their plans. However, the challenge as a planner, and I always forget this, which is why I tend to put on my landscape architect hat afterwards, is we're only here to plan. We can only make recommendations. We can't, our job is not to implement. Other agencies are responsible for implementation, but that's why, to Kenneth's point, we are the conveners. We want to bring all these people together to the table and say, hey, this is what we're planning. What can you do to help us implement this, um, these things? And Hopefully, everybody's not doing a lot of lip service and they're actually helping to implement things. Maybe not community that's transforming from like a negative to positive, but I think Irvine in California is regarded as somebody who's doing things right. But it's a very affluent neighborhood, which is maybe not a good example. But from a starting from scratch perspective, for example. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's really insightful. And I would just add, I think, too, um, shoot, I'm forgetting my point, but. Often, you know, a good plan is a great starting point, but people get fatigued too. So I think it's not just like having the right plan and the right set of recommendations, but it's also about like being strategic in how you go about it. Like the, the city plan might say in 50 years, things are going to look like this. But as part of that plan, there's going to be strategic opportunities where funding is available to make an improvement here and there. And so you can't go across all the neighborhoods in the city and say, well, we're going to be building this and this and this and this. You've got to really be able to deliver on that kind of commitment and frame things like this is a long range plan. But to that point of Irvine being a more affluent community, I think affluent communities can be thought leaders in this because money is power <laughs> and influence and these communities have the influence and they've been able to come together they've been able to push things forward because they have more resources and so they can be leading examples of how a community when that when it comes together for a purposeful thing can actually accomplish a great deal of of uh Positive. development and progress in their community so any other questions comments thoughts Okay. Well, thank you for your time today. Great, thank and you.